Diane Dinstall with North Penn Legal Services. Um, we're going to be discussing relocation in child custody cases. Um, Tim, I think we can go to, we might be able to skip the first couple of slides since you introduced us. Okay, that's good. Um, so usually when custody cases start, um, both parents are living in the same area. Um, so when one parent is seeking to move, um, what happens? Um, there is a child custody statute in Pennsylvania that comes into play that governs um, what needs to be done when a party in a custody case is relocating. Slide. Um, under the statute, there is a specific meaning for relocation um, because not every move that a party to a custody case makes is going to be a relocation. Um, it is defined in the statute as a change in the residence of the child, which significantly impairs the ability of a non-relocating party to exercise custodial rights. Um, this only applies when a parent with primary custody is seeking to move to another area. Um, uh, I would say it also applies actually when there's shared custody, um, shared physical custody between the parties. Um, situations where um, it can be debatable whether there is a relocation or not. Um, one example is if a parent is, move, is moving from Easton, Pennsylvania to Phillipsburg, New Jersey. Um, we're going to talk a little about what is and is not a relocation and why. Um, Uh, mother and child's living in Pennsylvania and the other parent lives in Georgia. Um, and then the parent in Georgia it decides to seek primary custody. That is not a relocation um, because the parent in Georgia already lives there and is not the custodial parent. So it's only the child who's moving. Um, a parent with partial custody who visits every other weekend wants to move to Michigan. Um, that's another example of something that is probably not a relocation, but what it is, is a situation that would require some kind of modification of the custody order uh, in all likelihood. Slide. Um, so there is a lot of debate about, um, what is a relocation and what isn't, um, and different attorneys and judges may have different takes on this. Um, so we can look to the case law for some guidance. Um, the case law recently has seemed to hold more and more frequently, that moves of even relatively short distances are in fact relocations. Um, generally, if you're moving um, out of the county to another county, um, in most courts that is going to be considered a relocation, but then a question arises when um, a move to another residence is um, going to be in the same county um, but depending on the facts, there may still be a significant difference in the distance from the other parent. Um, or, um, as in this case, uh, Ruiz versus Ryan Ruiz, um, there may be some other factor that impairs the other parent's, um, custodial rights. So in this case, um, which was uh, decided just this past summer, there was a move uh, by mother to another residence in the same county. Um, 
so the school district was different um the cat but the county was the same um mother's initial residence was six miles from father and the residence that she moved to uh, was 13 miles from father so we're talking a difference of seven miles um which i think a, a lot of experienced attorneys would not usually consider to be a relocation um however the court here found that it was um and uh i'm not going to read from the slides directly for the sake of time but generally um there was a, a, an issue with the school district changing um father used to commute from his home to the child's school um and would attend extracurricular activities to see the child um, and because of the greater distance even though it wasn't that far it really added on to the commute time and affected father's ability to participate in the child's life and specifically coaching one of his teams um the uh the court also had a little discussion of shared legal custody rights um and i think that's something that's important to keep in mind uh whether a move is a relocation or not um it will frequently implicate legal custody right so if le if legal custody is shared between the parties um, and one parent wants to move and is going to change the child's school district that's going to implicate the legal custody rights of the other parent whether it's a relocation or not so the court addressed that um, and then with everything together decided that the move to easton constituted a relocation as defined by the statute because it significantly impaired father's ability to exercise his physical and legal custody rights. And they actually upheld a finding of contempt against mother um, by the trial court, despite uh, uncontroverted evidence that mother was forced to move due to a rent increase and the unavailable unavailability of any affordable alternatives within the same town. Um, and so in that situation, you know, you may have a client who doesn't have a choice but to move um and that's fine but they need to be advised to file a relocation as soon as they become aware of the need to move um and i think that's something that even advocates who don't normally handle custody but perhaps who handle eviction and landlord tenant issues should keep in mind um that if your client has a custody case and has children to um make sure that you're aware of the issues that may arise um, and that you can advise them accordingly. Um, I think I'm ready for the next slide. Um, this is another recent case. Um, this one um, is a precedential decision, uh, Graves v. Graves. Um, and this kind of goes back to one of the examples in an earlier slide where neither party is seeking to relocate and it's only the child who would be moving a significant distance, then no um, notice of relocation is required to be filed. Um, but the court must still consider any relevant relocation factors which will be discussed later uh, in their best interest analysis so um, an example would be mother and well this in this case mother and father had lived um, miles apart for years with mother having custody of the child um, and then the trial court had awarded primary custody to father without conducting any analysis of the relocation factors um, so the Superior Court stated a prior case uh, slide. Uh, I seem to be missing. Um, oh, I, I guess it's just not, we don't know the name of the prior case, but in the prior case, they held that um, the notice and no, this isn't, I'm sorry, I think we're missing a slide, um, but in the prior case, um, if I remember correctly, 
um, the court had held that a um, a relocation um, only needs to be filed when the when a parent who has some form of custody of the child is moving, not when it's only the child who moves. Um, however, the court also, because the child is moving some distance, the court does have to include an analysis of the relocation factors um, that, that apply in that case. And not all of them may apply, but if they do, they need to be analyzed. Um, there is a, um, a notice and petition for those who are unfamiliar um, that needs to be filed when a parent decides to relocate. And this notice and opportunity to respond are fundamental components of the legal system. Um, a lack of providing notice um, and giving the other party uh, an opportunity to either consent or object, um, that becomes an issue with notice. For instance, when one parent moves um, and the other parent files a petition with the court um, or a parent plans to move and before the relocation is approved by the court, right? So a parent may file a relocation, but the other party has 30 days to um, file their response and then the court will schedule a hearing. Um, and frequently we do have situations where a client says that they're moving and their lease is up at the end of the month. Uh, so they don't have the choice to wait until um, the court actually approves the relocation. Um, and that would be a defense if that would come up, right? So the statute does allow for you to, um, you're supposed to file the relocation at least 60 days before moving, but there are exceptions um, because the court does understand that real life happens and that's not always possible. In that case, it just needs to be filed as soon as you can. Slide. Um, after analyzing the case, once you've decided that there is, in fact, a relocation, um, and I would say if you're not sure, um, you should advise your client to err on the side of caution and file it, um, just in case it is considered to be a relocation, because you don't want to find that out when the other party files contempt later, right? Um, worst case scenario, you file a relocation, the court says, this isn't a relocation, I don't need to rule on this, that's fine. Um, you have to provide a notice of relocation um, and a blank counter affidavit um, and serve these documents on the other party. Um, and then they have 30 days to either say that they consent to the relocation or um, they object to it. Um, and they can also, um, you know, frequently when you file this, it goes along with a modification, depending on how far the move is, if the schedule needs to be changed. The other parent will also have the opportunity to perhaps consent to the relocation, but not to the proposed change in the schedule. Um, and if there's any kind of objection or disagreement, the case is going to be scheduled for a trial. Slide. Um, regarding notice, there is a recent case that um, ruled that formal relocation procedures must be followed. Um, you will probably, in your practice, come across plenty of clients who think that they don't need to file for relocation because they told the other party uh, about the move and the other party said that's fine and they made alternative custody arrangements. Um, Atlin v. Deal is a case where that's exactly what happened um, twice. Mother moved twice and didn't file any relocation with the court. Um, and at least the first time that she had moved, um, she'd had a conversation with it about, I'm sorry, with father about the move uh, under her understanding was that he consented to it um, and uh, the parties had modified the custody schedule to accommodate mother's move um, but she never filed anything with the court and so later dad filed contempt and the court did find mother in contempt of the statute 
um, finding that regardless of what the conversation was, even if father did verbally approve at the time of the relocation, she still needed to file the notice with the court. Um, the formal procedures had to be followed. Um, and in contrast, um, there, there was another recent case where the same court held that it was not abuse of discretion for the trial court to decline to impose a sanctions against a relocating party for failing to provide formal notice. Um, so this would seem to contradict Atland v. Deal, but the broad principle underlying both of these decisions is that the trial court seems to have a lot of discretion in terms of whether or not it will impose sanctions on a party for relocating without filing a formal notice. Slide. Diane, there's a couple of questions in the chat. If oh, OK. okay and I, I think the next slide uh, is going to switch over to John Bogdanovich anyway. So OK. So um, Stephen Fernando is asking, does a relocation require an open custody case, or can it be a standalone filing? Um, uh, yes, is the answer. Um, so there does not need to be an existing custody case for a relocation to be required. Um, even if, um, you know, there needs to be a, a custody situation, I would say, but not necessarily an existing order. So the parties may have um, just come up with an agreement out of court and they never went to custody court. Um, you would still need to file a relocation. Um, however, you, you do have to have an underlying action in order to file that. Um, it can't, it's not going to be a standalone um, filing. The um, court, family court administration would probably instruct the client. Um, they're going to need to file an initial custody complaint along with the um, petition a notice for relocation in order to basically like open a custody docket to have something to file the relocation to. And the other question is from Wendy Schneider, who said, what about when the non-primary parent already moved out of state and now the primary parent wants to move out of state, but to a different state uh, other than the, than the other parent, but closer to that parent? Still? Does the primary parent need to go through the relocation procedures? Um, I, I, it would, okay. I don't believe so. I mean, I would look at the specific facts of the case in terms of, you know, is this other parent seeing the child and what is that arrangement? Okay. So, um, in most cases, I think the answer is going to be no, they don't need to file a relocation because the question is, is their move going to impair the custodial rights of the other parent? And if they're actually moving closer to the other parent, then the answer to that is no. But there are situations where the answer to that might be yes. For instance, they may be moving to another state that is closer to the non-custodial parent. However, perhaps their current uh, custody arrangement involves, uh, all right, let's, for the, for the sake of, explaining this more efficiently. Let's say that mom, okay, mom is the one who is wondering if she needs to file a relocation. Dad is the one who already moved and lives out of state. Let's say that their arrangement currently is that uh, dad has family here. So dad frequently makes trips here to visit his own family. And when he does that, he sees the child. Um, if that's the case, then mom would need to file a relocation because her move out of this area would significantly impair dad's custodial rights, even though his primary residence is out of state. Does that sufficiently explain that? Yeah. She, yeah, she did also just put a, a note that the primary parent currently has sole custody at the time due to a PFA. Would that affect the analysis? Um, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I think that just goes to, you know, that that shows that her move to another state is not going to significantly impair the custodial rights of father, because those are non-existent right now. Um, not to mention that there is a whole lot of um, case law involving domestic violence and relocation. Um, there are certain 
um, defenses to failing to file a petition and notice to relocation associated with being a victim of domestic violence at the hands of the, uh, the other parents, which I wish we had time to get into today, but I, and I think there may be some coming in the slides, but not a whole lot. Are, are there any other questions? That's it for now. Okay, uh, I think that John, John Bogdanovich is gonna take over now. Okay, um, my name is John Bogdanovich. I'm a staff attorney with North Penn Legal Services. Um, prior to 2011, most custody cases, um, the, the issues were addressed in case law. In 2011, the Pennsylvania legislator created the uh, 16 factors that I think everyone's pretty familiar with in custody cases. So they require that the trial court has to address all 16 or um, it could be reversible error and it could be remanded to the trial court if there's an appeal. Um, a lot of that was the, the result of Justice Bear, um, the late Justice Bear, who was really interested in, in family law cases and wanted to make it as clear as possible on how the lower courts were going to address the cases. Um, in addition to the 16 factors um, in custody cases, the 2011 Act also provided for factors in uh, relocation cases. So there's 10 factors in relocation cases that the trial court has to address, or it could be re reversible error. Um, so if it's an initial custody case right from the beginning, and on top of that, you're going to be dealing with a relocation case, the court and both parties are going to have to deal with 16 different factors. Some of them overlap, but it, it is a lot of work for the trial court and for the attorneys. Um, it's very important for parents who are thinking of filing for relocation to look over the factors to make sure that they'd have at least a fighting chance um, to be granted the right to, um, to move out of state or move out of the county. Um, there's, as you can see on the page right now, there are <clears throat> 10 factors and these are the factors for relocation. Um, because of the time, I'm not gonna read them one through 10, but obviously we're gonna be providing this information to you in the PowerPoint that we'll be mailing emailing it to you after, after the, the seminar is over. With the notice of relocation, what has to be in the notice of relocation um, includes the proposed change to a different address, the names of everyone who will be living with the children at this new address, the home phone number, um, the date of the proposed relocation and the proposed revised custody schedule. These are all things that have to be prepared when you are filing um, for relocation and has to be provided in the, the relocation notice. And then you have to give them the affidavit and the opportunity to object within 30 days. Okay, um, the 30 day, um, the, the, well, the 60 day, notice that you have to give on a proposed can be mitigated, especially if there's domestic violence involved. The court would consider um, almost an immediate move to a different state or a different county um, that you're fleeing from a domestic violence situation. The court would look at uh, waiving the, the requirement for the 60 day notice in such a situation. Okay, slide. And a lot of relocation cases, unfortunately, it will include the, the main issue as being domestic violence. Um, the court will consider, you know, the history involved and in including physical abuse. Um, in situations, they'll see how long ago the, the physical abuse or the, even the mental abuse occurred. Um, and this, uh, um, vignette, it says that the party separated four years ago. Father has two convictions of endangering welfare of the child from 20 years ago and terroristic threats and assault from five years ago. Neither of these uh, crimes involved either the mother or the child. Father testifies that he has completed counseling, completed his sentence, 
and has remained arrest free. Okay, uh, you know, I would argue if I was representing mom that um, even though it seems that a lot of these issues, including the endangerment of welfare, of welfare of the child was 20 years ago, that it is still relevant. Um, there's a lot of history in, in both, you know, case law and, and mental health issues that once a person is a batterer, they're going to be a batterer for the rest of their life. And what I mean by that is, you know, in the drug and alcohol abuse uh, arena, once you're an alcoholic or you're a drug addict, you're going to be an alcoholic or drug addict your entire life. You could be in remission. Counseling in a lot of situations is going to be successful, but unfortunately, it's not going to be successful in every scenario. So if I was representing mom, I would be arguing with the court that even though the father has gone through, you know, anger management classes and maybe even domestic violence classes, there's still going to be the, the very real possibility that the batterer will return to past behavior. So I would think that that would, you know, still be a very relevant and prevalent factor in relocation. As for the mother, it says here, how are we going to show the, the parents' abuses continued risk to the child and how to show it if it's not a risk? The mother had a DUI. I think it's important to know the history. Is this the first time she's ever had any alcohol-related incident? Um, you might be, want to <clears throat> be wondering what's going on in mom's life if there's been a, a complete change of behavior. Um, is she suffering from depression? Is she suffering from other mental health issues? So if I was dad's attorney, um, even the simple fact that she has a DUI, I would be looking into what the reasons, um, if her behavior has changed, if her attitudes change, and maybe have to get an evaluation, either from drug and alcohol or even a mental health evaluation to ensure that this was a one-time incident with the possibility of it reoccurring very small. Okay, slide. Okay, one of the big issues in relocation is education. Um, will moving the child to a different location enhance the quality of a child's educational experience? This could be very difficult to prove. Um, here's an, a local case that the child's education, there was no admissible evidence offered concerning the public school that mother proposed the child to attend. However, the court recognizes that a move to Texas would necessitate the child acclimating to an entirely new school district and having to make new friends as both children have attended the same school district for years. Um, they've expressed concern about making new friends in Texas. The court believes that this is a factor that needs to be considered. Um, so the court's looking at the education issue as almost a socialization issue. They're going to have to make new friends. They're going to have to adapt to a new region. Um, there's also, you know, the arguments on whether the new school district is better than the one that the children are in right now. Um, if it's in the state of Pennsylvania, you have the Department of Education ratings that come out every year and all the school districts across Pennsylvania. So you have a, a lot of information as to how these school districts are rated. So you might be able to make a meaningful argument with the court um, using the data that you might be able to get from the education department to show that the new, the, the new school district is gonna be much better for the kids. A lot of kids today have you know, special needs um, in their education. And there's also ratings from the Department of Education in Pennsylvania on that. Uh, if it's going to be an interstate uh, transfer to a new school district, it's a little harder to, to compare apples and oranges. Um, there's many out sites out there. There's one popular site called niche, N-I-C-H-E dot com. And they rate uh, school districts across the country on the teachers, academics, and diversity. And that's been used in, in many situations in Lackawanna County when you have an interstate transfer to a new school district. Um, obviously, if you can get an expert um, who's in the rating of you know, school districts, um, that could be very useful, but it would be very expensive. Um, and for most of our clients, they're not going to be able to afford that. So I would recommend leaning on the Department of Education ratings. Um, and lay opinion, I don't know how much worth the child, the, the court's going to put on, you know, people 
talking over the backyard fence saying, what's a better school district? I think you're going to need some data that's going to be reliable. Um, like I said, you know, the best thing would be to get an expert, but it would be very, very cost costly. Okay, another issue that comes up a lot in uh, relocation cases is the preference of the child. Um, this one case, ECS versus MCS from 2021, um, determined that one of the factors is the ch ch preference of the child, and it determined that the trial court who declined to interview children ages six and seven um, was um, a reversible error, that the court erred in not talking to the children. Um, the court heard held that in ancillary issues, um, the child's preference is going to be relevant. Um, so, you know, the, the court can make the children um, testify and try to make them as comfortable as possible. Um, the court can, you know, do the interview of the children in camera, uh, maybe only the attorneys present and maybe not even the attorneys present. Um, the, the court can do it more of an informal setting, have the judge not have the robe on, maybe do it at the end of the day so that, you know, the children are a little more acclimated and not as active. Um, and one of the other things that's very popular, at least in Lackawanna County, but I'm sure in some of our neighboring, is for the judge to appoint an attorney, a guardian ad litem, to interview the children and look at the, the preferences of the children and look at you know, the reasoning of the children, um, if it's appropriate, if, you know, if it's just that they, they're, they're gonna miss you know, the, the candy store down the road, that may not be a very relevant factor in relocation, but if they're gonna miss you know, their teachers and their friends um, and their, their little league team that they're playing on, those are all issues that the court is gonna you know, look at regarding the preference of the child. Um, so I guess the bottom line is it's the, the, and uh, with all these other factors, the trial court has a lot of discretion, and it appears that you know the appellate courts is saying that children, even at the ages of six and seven, have you know some legitimate issues that can be raised, and the court has to consider. Slide. Okay, Nick, I think this is your part. Thanks, John. My name is Nick Bykoff. I'm also an attorney with North Penn Legal Services. Um, I've, I've represented clients in a few relocation trials, uh, specifically in Northampton County. I think I've had, well, there was one in Lehigh County as well. Uh, one of the factors that comes up often is the quality of life. This is one of the factors that the court has to uh, take into account when they're deciding whether or not to grant the relocation. Uh, to look at quality of life, the term quality of life calls to mind different ideas. What would enhance hey, Nick, quality could I, of life? Could I just interrupt you? I think it's time that we're going to have to um, launch a poll for the CLE. All right. Oh, there it is. Yep. See the first poll there? Go ahead and answer that. Uh, so turning back to the issue of quality of life, quality of life is a term that calls to mind many different factors, and by nature, it sounds a bit subjective, just the term quality of life. However, there are certain things that the court uh, tends to look at specifically. Uh, I provided one case here from Northampton County that talks a little bit about that. Uh, in this case, the judge in Northampton County focused on the fact that the move would provide upward mobility in the mo mother's job. Uh, it would allow her to reconnect with friends and family uh, and that it reduced her stress living there. So those were, all, those were all quality of life issues that would be enhanced by the proposed move. However, when the court looked at all of the other factors, including the father's opposition to the move, desire to see the children more often, the court actually decided that the other factors weighed against the relocation. So even though the mother was able to show an increase in quality of life, that wasn't enough in and of itself to grant the relocation. 
turning to the next part. Uh, so quality of life. So again, certain issues and practice pointers for people when they're looking at how can I show an increased quality of life for the mother or father and the child. Uh, the court can look at issues like a support system, friends, family, uh, people in that area that will be beneficial for the parent and the child. Uh, similarly, uh, family ties and employment opportunities. That's something that I have always, in my experience, that I've heard the court uh, look into. Uh, will the mother be making substantially more money? Will her job uh, offer a real pathway to a promotion or a better opportunity? Um, you know, that's not always the case. And so sometimes that issue isn't, isn't present or we're not able to show that. I'm turning to the next part. So a couple of the issues I raised here are based off of cases that I've worked on. Um, for instance, the client is unemployed, uh, maybe doesn't work at all. Maybe the client receives disability. Um, maybe the client is leaving a domestic violence situation to move. How would you show the increase in quality of life? Is leaving domestic violence enough in and of itself? I mean, I've certainly argued that multiple times uh, that leaving domestic violence would reduce the exposure to being battered. Uh, it would provide uh, a benefit to the child not having to witness the domestic violence between the parents. If we look at case law in Pennsylvania, uh, the recent case law has looked at the fact that witnessing domestic violence uh, can be taken into account by the court, even if the child is not being physically harmed. So I've made this argument before with, with varying results and how the court will credit that and how much credibility uh, they'll agree that the client has on that issue. Uh, similarly, if the client is showing that they'll move to a better area or, or the, their spouse is taking a job, with an increased salary or an opportunity for promotion. Those are issues that the court can look at as well. So those are some of the quality of life challenges. Another interesting issue that comes up is the motive for moving. So in other words, the motive for the mother or father in relocating, and then the motive for challenging the relocation by the mother or father if the parent is challenging it. So you have a situation maybe where the mother is seeking to re relocate. She claims there's a history of domestic violence. However, she has also withheld visits from the father for different reasons. The father is opposing the relocation. Let's say the father has a, um, has a history, a criminal record involving domestic violence. Uh, he shows up to court and says, I want to see my child more often. I want to be more present for my child, but I haven't been able to do that because the mother's withheld the child from me. Okay, so we have different motives, stated motives, and then question as to what the real motives are for the parent. For instance, is the father opposing this uh, because he wants to uh, exert more control over the mother? Uh, does it go along with his general uh, domestic violence that happened earlier? Or is he sincerely going to be more involved in the child's life? And is he going to do it in a constructive way? So here the motives of both parents are relevant for the court. And turning on to the next slide here, um, it brings up the issue of, if you have a father or a parent with a history of domestic violence, uh, again, are they being motivated by control over the other partner? Or are they, or how sincere are they in this? Um, one of the issues that can come up is if the court perceives that a parent is withholding visitation um, because they're simply, they're alienating the child from the other parent. So they're responding, they're responding to domestic violence. They're saying, I don't think I want the child to be around the father. He hasn't been abusive to the child. I'm withholding court ordered visits. I think that's always going to be a problem if you have a client in that situation, because the issue of if they are alienating the child, even if it's perceived that they're alienating the child, will always create a problem for the parent when they're trying to relocate. 
I'm moving on to the next part. Again, the history of alienation. Um, examples of that, now that's very um, fact specific. You might look at, uh, and a lot of times I think what happens here is you have one parent saying, I tried to make arrangements with the father, but he wasn't available. The father will say, I was available. I tried to reschedule for other times. You know, if it, it, it's very fact specific, but if the father is able to, or the other parent is able to show that they tried to make the visits happen, but they were, their work schedule interfered or something along those lines, the court is going to credit that. So you always want to make sure that both parents are working out to reschedule visits and trying not to stop visits from happening, I think. Another factor, and this is a general factor that goes towards abuse, domestic violence, and it's also a, a custody modification factor, is the level of conflict between both parents. So again, level of conflict is an issue like, like alienation. It might, it's very fact specific, and you, the court will look at what is the nature of the conflict that's going on here. Is this about the parents not agreeing on a schedule? Uh, is it an issue of one parent alienating the other parent? Or is there a severe history of domestic violence where the father has done this, maybe with other partners, the current mother, or vice versa? Uh, and what is going on? So the court will look at that and decide. Um, I've raised the issue here of expert witnesses in a relocation case. Expert witnesses have a very large role to play in relocation cases. However, typically because of the, the expense of an expert witness, uh, it, they're not as involved as often. But just to show an example that I thought was interesting, we had a relocation um, talking about emotional harm to the child. Um, in this case, the psychologist testified uh, that relocation will emotionally harm the child. Uh, he talked about quality of life. He said, there's no question in my mind that the educational facilities uh, in Lexington, Massachusetts would be far superior to where the child is currently located. So again, that's an issue of an expert weighing in on education. Uh, and, that's an ex and that's an area where an expert can make a very big difference, as opposed to having a parent say, you know, we've heard that this school district is a lot better. The, uh, the expert can evaluate the data and make conclusions about that. So an expert can be very impactful. Uh, finally, about the issue of address confidentiality. When we work with domestic violence clients, we sometimes have a situation where their address is confidential, but they've registered for a confidential address, meaning a PO box uh, in, the, in the jurisdiction of the court, but not necessarily revealing where's the child going to school, where does the child live, uh, things like that, like those types of facts. This can be a very dicey issue. Uh, basically, from my talks with the PA Office of the Victim Advocate, the victim has an absolute right to keep the current address private and confidential. That's something that the other parent doesn't have the right to know. However, the question of education and school district will probably invariably come out in a custody trial. Uh, there's probably little chance of keeping that type of information confidential. But for victims, this can at least give them the knowledge that the address is confidential, and at least that the home address is confidential and absolutely protected, even in a custody trial. So um, I think that's, and I talk again about the issue of you have a client, they're in a domestic violent shelter in Lancaster County, two hours from the other parent. Again, they have a confidential address. Let's say the case is in Lehigh County. They have a confidential address. They can use that address. But the issue of education in Lancaster County versus Lehigh County, I expect that would come up in the actual custody trial. But they can use the PO box on the notice of relocation. Um, so that's that's for my part of it. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Brian Pinella. Brian Pinella was a custody master in Lehigh County, and Northampton County, and I can attest from my experience, he does great work. Uh, we had some very difficult cases that came before Brian. Uh, now he's an attorney uh, working in private practice and family law litigation. And uh, maybe he'll be deciding custody cases further, further down the line. So I wanna turn it over to Brian. 
Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you to everybody else. As Nick alluded to, I uh, just some background on me. I, I was a custody master for six total years um, over here in Northampton County and then over in Lehigh County as well. Um, in my role, especially uh, for those of you that don't know, um, actually, I'm going to ask if you don't mind, could we get slide number nine up? That's just the uh, the uh, uh, factors of relocation just generally. If we could just have that up in the background, that'd be really helpful. Um, and for those that don't know, just uh, the two different systems that we have really with two sister counties is uh, in Northampton County, the custody masters, it, it's a, they're conciliatory. Uh, it's all uh, just mediation. And then over in uh, Lehigh County, they run a uh, different system where Yes, most of the custody cases will come before the masters at some point, uh, but ultimately, um, if a case only uh, contains issues of partial physical custody, then the masters can actually run the hearing itself. It will be on the record, um, but if it contains relocation, if it contains uh, legal custody, then in those circumstances, the case would then be kicked up to a judge. Um, along with that, uh, I always found it to be a, uh, an important distinction to make, say, legal custody and uh, partial physical custody were the issues. Uh, in those circumstances, frequently what would happen is, is the masters would still only handle just the period of partial physical custody that was at issue, have that decided, and then the legal issue would proceed forward. Of course, inevitably, as everyone knows, uh, the exceptions get filed to those decisions as with almost everything. And then it would just be, all be heard by the judge uh, anyway. So I just wanted to touch on just a little bit of my background here. Uh, and they asked me in particular to talk about some of the arguments and uh, factors that I thought to be uh, persuasive, convincing, or otherwise, especially at the beginning of these relocation hearings. Uh, I, when you're looking at, uh, Line number two there, the age developmental stage needs of the child and the likely impact of the relocation. It talks about the child there, but uh, something that was always incredibly important to me and still does when handling relocation cases is also the physical condition of the parents themselves. Uh, I found that one parent's ability to actually provide the transportation or not provide the transportation isn't just a factor when you're talking about an initial custody case, but uh, especially about a relocation. For two individuals that own their own cars and typically provide 90% of the transportation themselves, uh, that may not be something that you want to consider. But say you have a client that's wheelchair bound and, uh, and frequently has other people helping provide for transportation, then when you're talking about a move, uh, when both parents are in Easton and one parent wants to move to Bethlehem, typically speaking, a move from Easton to Bethlehem would not really be seen as a relocation. But when you think about the actual feasibility and maybe the stubbornness of one parent for a lack of desire to want to help out, uh, when you start talking about actual transportation and physical capabilities of the parents, th that's really something that I always found very convincing. Um, uh, the other issues that we most frequently faced, I think, uh, was uh, a time frame issue. Uh, Diane touched on it nicely, I believe, uh, where it was uh, when you file, generally speaking, the rule of thumb is that you want to file 60 days out uh, from any proposed relocation. Uh, but the issue becomes uh, once it's filed, then the other side has 30 days to respond. Uh, and then it becomes a question of, okay, we finally get in front of the master, or even you get in front of a judge for the first time, and you're, you're knocking on the door of uh, your supposed move date. Um, you know, and let's just say it was the first pretrial conference. Uh, the question often becomes, well, am I still allowed to move with the child while this is a still a pending issue because it's going to a full trial and relief hasn't been granted yet, but my new job starts in Georgia. Uh, frequently, we have found, at least in the two jurisdictions I worked in, that no, you make arrangements for that kid to be staying local, uh, you know, especially if, you know, a, one with a relocating parent is proposing to move to Georgia and the child is enrolled here in the Eastern School District. Uh, obviously, that, obviously, that includes legal custody as well, but that move with the child is not happening. 
necessarily until the relief is granted. Um, so to me, I always found that the time frame issues were the ones that we were the most hesitant about in terms of how uh, of push, pushing up the list uh, because we wanted to address them quickly. We wanted to address them adequately, but we needed to address them with a certain mindset that these are things that are becoming real practical issues immediately. Uh, another one, there's actually a, a case that's going on right now in Northampton County. It's, it's in trial right now. It started in front of me uh, two years ago uh, as a master, and it's in trial right now before one of our judges out of respect for the privacy of the parties. I won't say the judge, um, but they it's ongoing right now because the one parent was proposing a relocation to Arkansas. And then uh, just, it, it was a combination of relocation plus absconding with the child. Um, because when the relief for the relocation was denied, that parent just picked up the child and moved to Arkansas anyway. Uh, so uh, that really, uh, that time frame issue is really one that we wanna be most mindful of, at least on the end of, uh, uh, when you're sitting on the master end or judicial end of it, because it's, it's something that a lot of people from a practicality standpoint have to deal with. Uh, we, there was also, uh, someone made, uh, uh, touched on the uh, issues with evictions and landlords and landlord tenant issues. Uh, while not nearly as common as you might have with time frame issues, uh, but it is something that you have to deal with. Uh, if someone's being evicted, that's not just a relocation issue. That's also most likely a, a petition for modification issue, which then also triggers the uh, involvement of children and youth. Uh, nine times out of 10, uh, uh, if children and youth is involved, they're gonna be involved for at least a period of six months. Uh, in my experience is both as an attorney uh, when I was representing children and youth and with uh, uh, the custody cases. Um, and there's a fair number of uh, there's a fair number of cases out there that specifically address dependency of children and youth and how it interacts with custody and relocation. Uh, a frequent issue with children and youth is housing, and uh, you know you, we want to encourage parents that may have children and youth involvement due to poor housing conditions, uh, but they must be mindful of when they're moving. Uh, out of those poor housing conditions to more appropriate housing conditions, that they are not moving to somewhere that would trigger the relocation statute. Uh, a primary issue with that is if you are in the children and youth process, whether it be through dependency or otherwise, and then uh, you're trying to find, and, and the primary concern is housing, and you have finally secured housing, but you can't move into that new housing yet because you have to now go through a relocation issue. Uh, because the case law out there says that children and youth cases and custody actions are to proceed at the same time. One, uh, the action of one does not beget a stay of the other and vice versa. Uh, they, they proceed down the lines largely at the same time. Uh, so when you're talking about eviction and when you're talking about landlord tenant issues, the primary issue, at least there for me, was finding safe housing, but making sure that's still local enough that you're not gonna trigger the relocation statute. Because if you trigger the relocation statute, then you're not necessarily gonna be able to move to that better housing until the conclusion of that relocation hearing, which in and of itself is going to prolong the involvement of children and youth. Uh, so that's just a careful tap dance that I always like to make people aware of. And then uh, you, you touched nicely upon the idea of the PFAs, uh, a parent receiving uh, sole legal, sole physical custody on a temporary basis through a PFA, at least in my practice experiences, was not the immediate write-off of, hey, I can go and do what I want with the child now. I had to deal with that over in Lehigh County. A uh, parent filed for a PFA, received a temporary PFA, uh, and uh, received sole legal, sole physical custody on a temporary basis, and then uh, fled to Egypt because uh, technically speaking, didn't have to provide much, uh, it didn't have to provide much information because of that legal custody. Um, so that's just always, if you are on the other side of a PFA, one parent now has the sole legal, sole physical custody on a temporary basis, uh, and you're representing the defendant in the custody action, that is also the defendant of the PFA action. Uh, the number one thing I would suggest to do is get in and file a modification as quickly. Uh, I see uh, Diane posted a, a question here uh, for Brian. 
How can we best advocate for our clients who simply cannot wait for approval before they move? Most of them have ext extremely limited financial resources and the current, ooh, I just lost it. Most of them have extremely limited financial resources and the current rental market is presenting a lot of problems. Many clients need to move in with family members who may not be local. You're completely right, Diane. That is one of the most major issues that we have to deal with right now. The housing market is outrageous still. Uh, the rental market, you can't find an open one bedroomer, it seems, for under uh, $1,500. Uh, my advice would be first get in touch with the local ministries. Uh, and by ministries, I mean places like a Third Street Alliance or a, uh, a New Bethany Ministries, they will frequently have uh, more common programs to get people into affordable housing that is for men for single families. Uh, along with that, uh, never doubt the power of a request and a filing for an emergency hearing uh, and try and push that up. Uh, I, I've seen that be successful in multiple locations and in multiple uh, issues. Um, a rule to show cause and a request for an emergency hearing are powerful tools that I don't think people utilize enough. Uh, because when you start talking about the extremes, especially from the North Penn Legal Services aspect, if you have clients that are financially strapped, you don't have, say, a doctor or somebody that has money to throw at an attorney uh, and other housing. Um, it was my, it's been my experience is that courts in multiple jurisdictions are extremely open to all of those items to address as quickly as possible. Uh, and with that, I, I, we are at one o'clock. Um, before I finish up, I just wanted to say thank you to our other presenters. They really did uh, the heavy lifting on this and it was incredibly informative. So I just wanna say thank you for being able to be part of a very informative and knowledgeable panel. So thank you to the other presenters